Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into Your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for another opportunity that You've given us to come together and feast upon Your Word. I thank You, dear Father, for the, Your Holy Spirit, for the direction that He gives us in our lives, that He's our Comforter, that You're our Father. We give You all the glory, the honor, and the praise. I ask that You would filter out all of that which is not of You, not of the Holy Spirit, all of the foolishness and all of the ignorance, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. On Wednesdays, we've been discussing various topics, and this Wednesday I've decided to speak on something that you might find. Uh, some of you may find it interesting, some of you may not. Uh, I, I believe it's relevant uh, given the, the time that we're living. I believe that there is strong evidence for 2030 being the year of the return of our Lord. I wouldn't say that dogmatically, but that takes us down to 2023 as being the year of the rapture of the church. If that occurs, that's wonderful. If it doesn't, we stay the course. Uh, we know that our Lord's timing is perfect. What I would like to talk to you about is since we know that He is returning soon, uh, there's little doubt about that at this point. How are we to prepare ourselves to meet Him? We know by studying the, both Testaments, the Old and New Testaments, we know the, that Israel exists at the present time in a, a state of unbelief. Uh, they won't recognize Christ as their Messiah uh, until they cry out to Him for deliverance. Uh, at the end of Daniel's 70th week, uh, many will come uh, to be delivered during that seven-year period known as, as the tribulation period. Israel has always been distinct from the church. The church is unique in, in, in so many respects. It would, it would probably take at least a dozen videos to go over all of those distinctions. There is a salvation, a deliverance for Israel, as well as there is a salvation and a deliverance for the church. I'm not talking about redemption. I'm not talking about being born again. I'm talking about deliverance. The question folks, is can science or philosophy or, or any other thing, really, uh, just by searching, can man find God? And, of course, the answer is uh, no. Uh, the only way that we can know who God is and what God does is if He reveals it. Uh, your God is not what you made him to be, made him up to be, or, or what you think that he ought to be, uh, or he's not, you know, the one that seems to be the most logical. God reveals himself in his word, and far, far too many don't come to the text with the absolute confidence that, that, that this, it is God's word. Uh, especially today, the day in which, the time in which we're living, the uh, authenticity, the authoritative nature of God's Word, the inerrant uh, uh, Word of God is being attacked uh, from every which direction, even among conservative Christians today. Those who were, uh, who were used to... Uh, those who, whom God used to pen the words of Scripture uh, were not putting down their own thoughts. 
their own ideas. It was uh, Holy Spirit inspired. They were led by the Holy Spirit. And what they put forth was the word of the Holy Spirit. But there were false prophets among the people. Uh, just as there were in the days of Israel, uh, in the Old Testament, there are false prophets today. And that word prophet, just the word prophet, don't let it throw you. Uh, when, when you hear the word prophecy, uh, automatically we tend to think of things future. Whereas that's really not how the word is used in the, in the word of God. It, it's, it does include at times things future. But the word prophecy is, uh, is more related to the word teaching. There were false prophets among the people. Uh, they, they were among the people, uh, even as there shall be false teachers among you, Second Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 1. You know, there is a huge difference between false teachers and false uh, false teaching. I say that because it, it seems to me in the Scriptures that we have to make a division somehow in our minds between false teaching, which, which needs to be rebuked, and, uh, and false teachers who oftentimes, uh, even though uh, the teaching itself must be examined in light of the truth, uh, a brother or a sister in Christ can teach error, uh, myself included, and that does not make us a false teacher. And I'm more than willing to admit uh, to you all that I have a, I have great difficulty in that discernment of of who's the false teacher and who isn't. I don't I. I don't have the list. I don't think that there has ever been a single individual who ever taught God's Word who didn't make theological mistakes. You know, that word heresy is thrown around a lot. You know, if you're a good, solid covenant theologian, then a dispensationalist teaches heresy, and if you believe in limited atonement, then those who teach unlimited atonement, well, they're heretics or vice versa. And, and the word heresy becomes quite common because I believe there is a tremendous temptation to want to judge others, and I don't think our responsibility is to do that, but to judge teaching. Uh, you, you all know the Scripture in Galatians, if any man preach any other gospel than that which you've received, let him be accursed. And the context clearly says that, that there were those in Galatia who were doing that. And what were they doing? Well, they were teaching that something, that something more is necessary for you to be redeemed. If you were an Israelite living back in, in the Old Testament, uh, you would have had been faced with the same challenge. If you were one of God's people, you would have been faced with the same challenge that we're faced with today. And that's discerning truth from error. But more importantly, the challenge, the great challenge, is trusting God that what He said is true. The Jews had the Old Testament prophecies. They knew, they should have known that the Messiah was who He was, who He said He was, when He arrived on the scene, but they did not. We're told to examine the Scriptures uh, daily to see if these things be so. And it also says that if an angel from heaven, you know, uh, preach another gospel. You know, so how in the world do I discern whether or not this person is, is an angel? Well, you know, my mother called me an angel, but that's... Uh, but she didn't do that for very long. I, I think what the text is saying is that this concept for you is so important that even if an angel descended from heaven and stood on a pulpit, stood behind a pulpit and preached a false gospel, let him be accursed. That's how crucial this is. 
to God. There is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then there's the idea that it's up to you whether you go to heaven or hell, which is not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I preached that on this channel for going on now nearly six years, or six years, a little over six years. I'm in my seventh year of doing that. Doesn't make me very popular, but uh, that's something that I don't, I don't, I don't tend to, to worry. I don't mind that much at all. Here's a loving Heavenly Father who didn't allow you to choose your dad, didn't allow you to choose your mother, didn't allow you to choose the decade or the century uh, in which you were born, didn't allow you to choose the nation in which you were born, didn't allow you to choose a whole lot of other things I don't have to mention. Uh, but that's all right. He loves you so much, He'll let you choose hell. No, folks, people made that up. That is not the gospel. How are you born again? By accepting Christ? Show me the scripture. I issued a challenge years ago. I've never had anyone step up to that challenge to show me one verse of scripture that says that we're born again by God from above by something that we do. And despite the, uh, what appears at least on the surface to me to be the, uh, the most common belief, the popular belief, that, uh, that we do, we must do something to be born again. I have yet to find any, any concept of that at all in the Word of God at all. Now, I do want to, to, as I go through this message here this evening, I just want to make sure that I do continue to draw a sharp distinction between redemption and salvation. God redeemed His people Israel. Most of them perished in the wilderness because of, due to unbelief, because of their unbelief. They didn't trust Him. The same message is there for us today as the church, the redeemed people of God who walked through this life, through our wilderness, not trusting Him. The question is, is when He returns, which He will, and I believe soon, how do you want to meet Him? Having walked through your wilderness, not having trusted Him as Israel didn't? How much does the word salvation mean to you really? Because redemption and salvation are not synonyms. Two distinctly separate, distinct words in the Greek. We were redeemed. We were purchased with a price. That was a one-time act, one offering by one offering. Our Lord Jesus Christ. By one death, one offering. That occurred. Christ did not die for your sins when you accepted Him. So, how are you born again? I mean, by, by accepting Christ, uh, you know, uh, by repenting, by walking the aisle, by shaking the pastor's hand, by filling out some little church membership card, I, I don't know, whatever. No, you were born again by the will of God, John 1.13, not the will of the flesh, but the will of God. That's what the Word says. What is taught today as far as the Gospel is concerned would have been considered heresy 400 years ago. So this may be new to you. 
I may be new to you, this video may be new to you, this teaching, what I'm, you're hearing may be new to you, but it was not new to people 400 years ago. You know, in this gospel that says that man must do something to, to redeem himself, it's, uh, it, it'll, it'll be preached a million times uh, this Sunday. You know, where if, if you accept Christ, you won't go to hell, you'll go to heaven. Where is the verse? Show me the verse. There is no such verse. People just make that up. They made that up. Does false teaching magnify our Lord, Jesus Christ? You know, to, to say that, well, he, he did all that He could do and the rest is up to you. Are, are you going to suggest that your will is stronger than God's? I have to conclude, and it's a sad sad affair that I that I do that the majority of heaven bound Christians today don't believe the gospel in fact many of them never heard it let me tell you that what is preached in most churches in your community today would be branded as heresy 400 years ago so what has happened What's happened? You know, I've spoken on this subject countless numbers of times. The short answer is, is there's very little study of the Scriptures. Emotional Christianity, not intellectual Christianity. It's, it, it is not a foolish statement to suggest that most people who profess to be Christians know very little biblical truth. Even most pastors today that preach this other man-made gospel, they know that. We're sheep who are easily led astray. Is God concerned about it? Well, I'll... is He really concerned about false teachers and false teaching? Well, let's look. Let's look at some of this. Jeremiah 14, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Jeremiah 23, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say that he says, or that I say this, that, or the other thing. Behold, I'm against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. Micah 3, 5. Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err. Matthew 7.15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Matthew 24.11, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets that shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they would deceive the very elect. Acts 20, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves Enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an, an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. 2 Corinthians 11, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers 
also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. If you're looking for a false prophet, look in the pulpit. Ephesians chapter 4, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Philippians chapter 3, watch out for those dogs, those workers of evil, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God who glory in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in the flesh. And yet, the majority of Christianity today is focused, focused entirely on that concept. 1 Timothy 4, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. 1 Timothy 6, O Timothy, guard what's been entrusted to you. Avoid irreverent, empty chatter and the opposing arguments of so-called knowledge, which some have professed, have professed and thus swerved away from the faith. 2 Timothy 3, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. 2 Timothy 4, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. I consider this ministry and, and I consider the gospel preached today as a fable. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Titus 1, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for dishonorable gain. And I could go through a lot of other verses like this, but if I did, we'd be doing that for the next seven years. Second Peter, the third chapter, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. Jude 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old, ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God who is our Lord Jesus Christ. We're told to rebuke them. And of course, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Not I once did, but now I don't. I never knew you. I think the Lord does use false prophets to reach His own people. Uh, they may be led into error, but He gets them. I never knew you. 
Matthew 12, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. Uh, for the tree is known by its fruit. And contrary to modern preaching, the good tree isn't made good by the good fruit. The good fruit is the result of the good tree, and people get that mixed up. Don't have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And how would you reprove them? By your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Folks, I need to know what you say. I, I don't need to know the history of the tree, when it was planted, how it was fertilized. I, I need to look at the fruit. Good fruit comes from good trees, and it's Christ who said, by your words you will be shown to be righteous. Not made righteous, mind you, but shown to be righteous. A man is shown to be righteous by his words and shown to be unrighteous by his words. So if we're going to determine that, we need to know his word. Christ said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Second Corinthians 2, For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. We don't corrupt the Word of God. And folks, I am begging you not to consider that expression, the Word of God, to be your dreams, your visions, your convictions, your uh, whatever your, I don't know, co-workers, told you whatever your parents brought you up to believe or, any, or anything else but His Word. And it needs to be studied. Dearly beloved, however you, you cut it, we are running out of time. It does make a difference what we believe. It will make a difference when we're raptured. And we stand before God and give an account for the deeds that we've done in the flesh, whether they're good or bad. It will make a difference whether you fall into that category of being identically just the same as those in the wilderness who were God's people who perished and didn't enter into His rest because they didn't trust Him. Because they didn't believe Him. And... As I mentioned in an earlier video, a recent video, I'm pretty sure I did, that, that promised land is not heaven. It's rest. And there is a rest for the people of God. You'll find rest trusting Him. You will not find it any other way. 2 Corinthians 4, we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I'm, I am absolutely convinced that the Holy Spirit says that which is the Word of God, not, not my dreams, not my, my visions, not, or decisions, or not my design of God. You know, like, like you know, well, if, you know, for example, like, well, if there really is a God, then He ought to do this or He ought to do that. You know, it's, people make up God. They make Him into to being who they want Him to be. You can't do that. The only God I know is the God who revealed Himself in this book. He's the God who spoke the worlds into existence. He's the God who works all things after the counsel of His own will. He's a God who, who whatsoever He pleased, that did He in heaven and in earth and in all deep places. He's a God who placed the bow in the clouds. Note that He brings the cloud as well as the rainbow. So many Christians look at the difficulties and hardships in their life and they say, you know, surely this can't be from God. 
Oh, folks, you make your God up any way you want. Mine's in this book, okay? It's, it's the only one that I know. We are, we are also cautioned not to add to God's Word or subtract from it. But, you know, Proverbs 30, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. And add thou not therefore unto His words. Let the Word of Christ, it says, dwell in you richly in all wisdom folks we need to study this book time is short now if you want to flip that around and say well because time is short we don't need to study the book have at it go right it go right ahead if that's what you want to do i wouldn't recommend it timothy 4 take heed unto thyself and unto doctrine. Continue in them, that is the Word of God, the teaching, the true teaching of Scripture. For in doing this, thou shalt redeem thyself and them that hear thee. No. Save. Save thyself and them that hear me. And people say, you got to be kidding. That's not how you save somebody today. You know, today you tell them stuff that, that isn't, basically isn't biblically true. You know, if they'll do this, that, or the other thing, then they'll be saved. What they really mean is redeemed. Take heed unto doctrine. That's the only way you're going to save yourself and them that hear, 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 the, hear you. It's the only way. 2 Timothy 2, you know, everybody's familiar with the verse, study to show the self-approved unto God a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I've had Christians tell me, Steve, he's done it all. We don't have to do anything. They take it to the far right, far extreme, and he's done it all. We don't have to do anything. Just sit back. He's done it all. We have no responsibility at all. And that nothing could be further from the truth. We have an obligation. We have many obligations, but one of our primary obligations is to walk according to the truth. One of our primary obligations is to study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needs not be ashamed. If there was no responsibility, no obligation, no accountability, then what do those words mean? What, is it, what would it mean to be ashamed? We were, we were redeemed, folks, solely because God was and is faithful toward His own. You were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. If you were a Jew, uh, one of God's people, uh, Israel, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, you, if, if you were a member of that nation of people, you were a people that God called out for Himself. He chose a nation. Okay? He chose the nation. The nation didn't choose itself. Okay? You did not choose to become a Christian any more than Israel chose to be a nation. Now, if you want to go and meet the Lord, which I believe He's coming soon, and stand up there before God and try to explain that, be my guest. I, I don't think I could come up with the words to explain that. We were redeemed by God. That was a single act. But we are saved. That is delivered, rescued. That is, that is continuous. That is ongoing. What are, we, what are we saved from? And how are we saved? Well, we're obviously saved by believing God, trusting God. Deliverance comes through trusting God. It doesn't come through your good works. It comes through trusting God. What are, we, what are we saved from? Well, the fear of death. I don't know how many Christians I, I know I've met that are just afraid to die. They, or or they, they have a fear of death. A fear from guilt. A freedom from guilt. A release from guilt. And I don't know how many Christians I've met that are just burdened down with guilt. Uh, 
were delivered from the deadly influence of sin, self, the law, the world, Satan. Uh, folks, redeemed and saved are not synonyms. The next time you go through Scripture, particularly the New Testament, if you really want to dig into it, and you want to, and maybe perhaps even do a word study on the word saved, sozo in the Greek, you'll see that it is primarily referring to your ongoing deliverance from sin, self, the law, the world, everything that you, if, if you do have a good heart toward God, you are, you long for deliverance in those areas. The, the, the deliverance, the word, the saved, we're redeemed, but we are, we have been redeemed, but we are being saved, and we're being saved through the truth of this book and in trusting God concerning what He said, and that covers every single minute detail of your life, every instance in your life. I, I, I can say, well, I can tell you folks, well, we're being saved from sin, self, the law, the world. I can do that, and that's true. We've been saved literally from six things. Sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and death. Okay? Itself. But when you look at that, all that under a microscope, what you're seeing is that, is that you're, you're being saved daily as you trust Him concerning every little circumstance He brings into your life to test whatever faith He's given you. We were redeemed in order to be saved. Just as Israel was redeemed in order to be saved. Most of God's children will not be saved in this life. I hate to tell you, but they, that is the testimony of Scripture. Most will not be saved. And I'm talking about Christians who were bound for heaven, glory bound, made fit for heaven. He died in their place. They belong to Him. But they'll never be saved or delivered in this life. Because they walk in that very area in which they should be delivered. You know, folks, how can you be saved, delivered from law if you're living under law? Or, or how can you be delivered from self if you're trusting in yourself? How can you be walking according to the flesh and be delivered from the flesh? Why would one, one want to live according to... Why would any Christian want to live according to a, war, a world religious system based on human merit, even though it calls itself Christianity, when we've died to that world system. Now make no mistake about it, you haven't died to your brother and sister in Christ who's in that world system, but you've died to that world system. Redemption was only one part of God's wonderful plan for your life, folks. You were redeemed in order to be saved, that is, delivered in this life. And that through the personal exercise of your faith in Him, your faith regarding His promises, whereby we become partakers of the divine nature. We have an obligation to walk according to the Spirit. That is grace. Not according to the flesh, which amounts to law. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.